Yeah, this has become the the museum. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, o- over here, this is my dad's wall. This was my dad served in World War II. It was in Okinawa, Tinian, Saipan. That's a flag that he actually got from Okinawa. That's crazy. Sword he got off a uh, Japanese NCO. Uh, what a this, this this side over here is more the Afghanistan Iraq side. Yeah. We got random random crap from all over the place. <laughs> You've just been around too much. <laughs> That's true. Did. I've been uh, all the wrong places at the right I know, times. Right? Yeah. Did you and your dad talk about his time in World War II at all? Yeah. You know, it's interesting is that when I was a little kid, I used to go to all of his Marine Corps reunions every two years. So I'd get to hang out with all these Marines that, you know, were World War II vets. And I didn't really appreciate it, you know, when I was like 10 yeah. years old, 11 years old. And then, you know, as you know, I got older and then they all of a sudden thought that I should start drinking probably about 15 or whatever. <laughs> My dad would go, he'd hit the rack and uh, they'd start telling me stories be like, yeah, your dad, you know, he was the bravest officer we ever saw and this, that, and the other thing. He never showed any fear. And, you know, we'd be coming in, landing on the beaches. We keep looking at the Lieutenant as long as he wasn't scared, we knew yeah. we'd be good. And uh, so I talked to my dad about that. I was like, dad, how come you were never scared? And he's like, are you kidding me? He goes, I was terrified. I said, well, how come the Marines, they said you were never scared? He goes, well, that's something else. That's what the Marine Corps taught me is to maintain my bearing and to show the, this presence of command leadership and courage under fire. And I had no idea what he was talking about, but I was like, I got to get some of that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so uh, that motivated me to join the Corps when I was a little kid. That's crazy, man. That's um, to have a relative that served in World War II and is willing to talk about it. I think it's probably not a common thing. You know what I'm saying? And the fact that, and you got to yeah. hang out with his buddies, you know, which give you the real <laughs> story, <laughs> you know, which tell you like what really well, happened. Well, exactly. And that was the cool thing is that, Like I I originally enlisted and then later on when, you know, I became an officer, like my whole perspective of being a Marine was what it was like to be in combat and all these stories about how they would jerry rig stuff, how they'd steal stuff from the army and all the rest of these stories. And I'm like, yeah, that that's what you do. And, you know, I I was surrounded by a lot of officers that, you know, grown up in the garrison Marine Corps, which, you know, they're all about spit shot and boots, starching camis Mm -hmm. and all the rest. So it was a, you know, I, I, Fortunately, there was a lot of operational things going on, so I was able to fit in in that environment. Not so much in the garrison yeah, world. No, I, I totally get it. I totally get you. That's so <laughs> crazy that you got to. I mean, for me, I I really appreciate that. I I don't know if the average person appreciates the fact that you got to like walk amongst and talk to these legends of World War II. You know that these. It's like every Marine Corps birthday, half the the ball video is about World War Two and, and the stuff that those dudes did and stuff like that. And to be able to I've I've reached out to a few people to have try to get a World War Two vet on this on the podcast. It's obviously harder for someone that's a little older to get into technology and stuff like that. But it's just like those stories are what an amazing I don't know, what a, an amazing time to have been in the military and probably scary as shit too. You know, like your dad was saying. Yeah. Um, it's funny, uh, I had one of my Marines said something about, you know, sounding calm on the radio. Cause I was a JTAC when I was in, I don't know if you know too much about my background, but no, I don't, please I, share. I just, I just remember telling him like, dude, I got scared every time I fucking pushed a button down, man. You get nervous every time you're, I'm about to, <laughs> I'm about to direct aircraft, you know, to drop bombs, like training, no, no matter what it's that's, that makes you nervous. Like you just kind of. I got to the point, I was a JTAC evaluator. I got up to that point. So I got, to, even then, even awesome. then I'd be like, fuck, I, you know, cause you know, everyone's listening. Everyone's got their radio listening to how the control is going and how the mission's going. And it's like, um, I just, I'd tell myself, be like, oh dude, you, you've, you have way more experience than all these guys. Why are you even nervous? You know, <laughs> like, don't, I don't know. And, and I'll tell you, I, I got dropped on by uh, A-10s during the first Gulf War. We had thousand pound cluster uh, bombs pepper our freaking position. So that was probably the scariest situation I'd ever been in. You know, when you're when you're in the off- offensive, you don't have time to mm-hmm. be scared. But when you're sitting there in a defensive posture and then all of a sudden the world just starts like literally the ground starts waving, everything just starts turning upside down. 
fortunately, I had my whoopee, you know, I had my freaking poncho liner, so I was able to cover myself with that. So that, that kept me alive. A but that was terrifying. I can't imagine, <laughs> man. I've uh, I was talking, I had my buddy Paul Smith on the other day. He was the uh, first Marine Division JTAC manager. And um, he talked about being out on one of the training OPs out here and one of the JTACs. They, it was a nighttime operation or nighttime training evolution. And they were marking with an IR pointer, which is obviously you can only see with NVGs, right? Well, on the ground, someone opened a car door and the pilot thought that that was the end of the pointer. He saw that and thought that was the mark and dropped a 500 pound uh, training bomb. Luckily, it was training because it landed like 10 meters from him, is what he said. He said it fucking just slammed wow. right into the rental car uh, or right next to the rental car Jeez. that they had, they had gotten. I'm like, man, you know, those close calls, it happens. I I almost got hit by an arty round at Camp Lejeune, a 155 round hit. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, OP5, that area, but we, we had a round yep. land 50 yep. meters from us and the little, like that cul-de-sac area right next to OP5, it hit right there in that little cul-de-sac kind of thing. What is it? I there were, well, I, I'm sure there's been more than one incident, but it was funny because I was actually down Lejeune probably about two years ago, and somebody was telling me a story about that, where I think uh, the CG was briefing everybody out, and all of a sudden it was like, I gotta go, and I, I think you know round came danger close, and and I don't know if anybody got taken out in that incident, but it's uh, it's it, a dangerous it job, you know. It's a this is uh it's it's a dangerous job and it's very paramount that the people that are in these like combat arms jobs, these cannoneers, like in our case, the, the gun chief didn't verify the powder before they put the powder in. So they only put half the charge in that they were supposed to. And it landed outside of the impact area. So it's like one of those things, like I think sometimes we take it for granted because we're around all this craziness all the time, just from being in the Marine Corps, you take True. it for granted, like the, the safety aspect. And sometimes when something goes wrong, it goes horribly wrong because we're dealing with explosives or we're dealing with like these tens of thousands of pound vehicles. And, you know, it's crazy. I do want to ask you, though, you, sh you showed a flag yeah. that your dad had brought back, that Japanese flag. I saw a post the other day. There was a guy on one of the military pages was like, hey, this is my grandfather's Japanese flag that he had, he had gotten off a dude um, and he had left it to him. And he was uh, trying to return it to the family, um, to the Japanese family. Interesting. And there was like mixed like responses to that. Like some people were like, that's cool. Sure. That's really good for the family. It'll give them closure. And other people are like, your grandfather should have never given you that flag. I can't believe you're trying to give it away <laughs> kind of deal. What are your kind of thoughts on stuff like that? Like, is that something you think? Like you have a flag and a sword. Do you think you would ever attempt to even, has that even crossed your mind trying to get that back? Or is it like, Hey man, this is something from no. his time and it's something that honors his service. That's interesting. I ne never even thought about it. Uh, you know, it, it, it was purely, you know, and still is, you know, one of those things, which, you know, my father's service having uh, landed in Okinawa, Tinian, Saipan and all the rest, uh, that was sort of, uh, you know, the memento, the reminder, you know, I lost my father, you know, he passed away about 10 years ago. And, you know, I look at that and I remember him and, uh, you know, I'm going to think about that returning it though, you know, cause you know, we're obviously not at war with Japan anymore. As a matter of fact, we're, we're allies mm -hmm. and, uh, we may actually be fighting side by side with the Japanese someday, depending upon what goes down in the Pacific with yeah, China and that, yeah. uh, Taiwan and all the rest. So, uh, I, I had an interesting experience uh, at business school where we were talking about uh, how do you develop creativity? And the whole course was how do you, as a leader, manage and, and inspire people to be creative? And then we had this whole section on destructive creativity. Mm -hmm. And of course, the topic went to the nuclear bomb. And, you know, the whole class was how horrible it was that we created the nuclear bomb. It was horrible. And of course, you know, I raised my hand. I said, listen, my dad was on Okinawa. He actually flew back to Iwo Jima, had the landing plans for mainland Japan handcuffed to his wrist, flew them back to Okinawa and watched them getting briefed out. Had we not dropped the nuclear bomb, my father would not have survived and I wouldn't be here to this day. What was wild is there was actually a kid from Hiroshima. His family survived and he was in the class and he was talking about how horrible and devastating it was. And so it was a very wow. interesting dialogue back and forth between you know, him and I, and it's like, you know, war is a horrible thing. And uh, it's one of those things where it's up to the, the citizens to keep in check their governments and 
make sure that they're not they're not acting with unbridled yeah. aggression which is why we act with war to stop unbridled sure. aggression yeah i think that's well two things on what you just said like one that's crazy that what a small world that, <laughs> that a bizarre you know you're, you're the son of someone that would have been affected by it in the same room you know just happened to be in the same class as someone whose family bizarre. got hit by the atomic bomb like and what a small world one and two what an amazing country that we have where we can have those two types of people in the same room together and have a discussion without you guys like going at it or there should be some kind of family <laughs> blood feud, you know, something like that, you know, like that's not something you would see in True. other countries or something like that. I don't believe. Um, no, I agree. Man, that's crazy, dude. You have so many like weird <laughs> links to all this like stuff. That's insane. Well, I'll tell you another weird one just because of the timing is that yesterday was the, uh, End of the uh, or marks marks the 70th anniversary of the end of the battle in the Chosin mm-hmm. Reservoir from the Korean War, and uh, my uncle was actually awarded a silver a silver star from that Man. battle for taking command of a battalion that had pretty much stalled, and he he was in the army and he actually fought them up to link up with Chesty Puller, the first Marines, and they fought up in uh, Kotori, wow. and. Uh, just while, so I posted a whole bunch of pictures and a brief story about him uh, on Facebook just yesterday. So just kind of interesting time. Yeah, that's um, again, uh, that's another group of people I'd love to I'd love to try to get on the on the show is because what we see in combat today is completely different than what those guys were doing then. You know, the that was definitely more of a war of attrition. The casualties were much higher. The technology was way less, which meant that there were more casualties. I mean. And, and here's the real wild thing. So in 1996, I was actually in the operations section of uh, one Marine expeditionary force out in California. And I invited my mm-hmm. uncle to come be a guest out there for the birthday ball. And he showed up in his dress blues and he was like, 78 years old. And what was wild is, you know, we started hanging out. I introduced him to everybody. Next thing you know, the CG, General Fulford, and, and all the rest of these guys, they're all around him because our mission at the time was constantly going over to uh, Korea and sitting here doing the planning, coordinating, training to prepare to go back to the Korean Peninsula. And he had actually, my uncle had actually walked the ground that we were constantly evaluating. And so next thing you know, they're sitting around like a pile of mashed potatoes. Like, look, you can't go there in Cota Rhee because this is going to be here and the terrain is this and that. I mean, it was just the wildest thing. And it it was an amazing experience for me, obviously, to see my uncle talking about his combat experience and the Marines embracing him. He wrote me a, uh, a note afterwards saying, look, that was the greatest experience of my life. I always loved serving with the Marines. It was great to reunite with the Marines. And uh, unfortunately... Uh, he ended up passing away six months after that yeah. event. But, you know, it was great that in his world, he was able to get some closure and come back together and to be honored in such a way. And so, have uh, like a real world effect, just, man. I uh, bet some of the stuff he told him went yeah. into some O plans, you know, like went down the line and like, <laughs> absolutely. That's so crazy. Absolutely. I think if, if any of my listeners don't have not read anything or, or studied on the Korean war at all, I have a couple books like, uh, give me tomorrow. is a really good book. Um, the cover of it is just a powerful image of a kid um, that I think a time photographer took his photo and, and he took his photo right when he asked him like, what, uh, what, if you could ask for anything, what would it be? And he said, give me tomorrow. And so the whole book is about wow. the Korean war there. And then obviously last stand uh, Fox company, which is another amazing, like uh, title of Korean war. Here, here's a couple that uh, my dad or my uncle's written oh, up nice. in. Cause I was just reviewing these. And, uh, you know, kind of tells the story and a lot of them, a lot of the stories are kind of sanitized, yeah. but when my uncle told me the actual story of what happened and how he had to, he was a major, he was a, a staff officer and uh, general almond with 10th court told him, Hey, go down and get this freaking battalion moving. And he goes down there and finds this battalion snowed over and they're paralyzed with fear and, and hunger and, and all the rest. And he's like, Hey, Lieutenant Colonel. You need to get your uh, your battalion moving north. You need to attack north. And the, this lieutenant colonel says, listen, Major, we're not moving. We're sitting here. We're hungry. We're tired. We're cold. It's not happening. And my uh, uncle basically turned to the radio operator and said, 
company commander's up. <laughs> and he's like, what the hell are you doing? He goes, sir, stand relieved. I've assumed command of your battalion. And this freaking major, Major Gerfine, takes command of his battalion and gets them moving up north. And they engage the enemy. First time, they, they uh, hit a booby trap uh, from some blockage in the road. And the lead elements start turning and start overrunning the freaking mm-hmm. command element. And uh, my uncle talks about he took his, took his 45 out and said, turn the hell around. And they said, no, we're going to get killed. He goes, you might, but you definitely will if you try running yeah. beyond me. And uh, turned him around and then fought. The rear came under machine gun fire. He went and led them through all this. Ends up getting up there, linking in. He actually had a note from, it said, you know, set up your battalion on the reverse slope of Hill 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, Chesty. I'm like, you got a personal note from Man. Chesty Puller? He goes, yeah, we got attached to them. I was like, holy crap. And by then, the battalion commander was all warmed up. Everything was good. So he flew back. What was interesting is he was gone for so long, the headquarters wrote his obituary and re- sent it back to New York. Everybody thought oh, he was shit. dead. And when he comes back into the command, they're like, instead of being like, hey, you're a hero. Good job. They're like, where the hell have you been? Next thing you know, like, listen, you've got a stack of paperwork on your desk. Hey, you well, walk back to yeah. work. Go be a staff officer. <laughs> So it took a while for the story to come out, but uh, it eventually Man, did. Man, that's so crazy, dude. That's uh, what a <laughs> what a unique like. Uh, it sounds like your family history is just rich. Like they've been in all these like uh, all these key engagements. It's in, it's in my freaking it's in my DNA. My mom was inducted into the nursing corps in World War II in hmm. England, and so you know I grew up with the whole concept of what my mom would refer to, she's British, noblesse oblige, that those who have the ability have a responsibility to serve mm-hmm. others. And so, you know, I, people are like, hey, you know, how, how can you have enlisted when you're 17 and gone and served and gone in multiple conflicts? I'm like, I, I, I didn't know there was a choice. <laughs> it's just sort of how I was yeah, brought up. I, I, it, the military was kind of a, a thing for me. I always knew, my dad was in the army. I never had, there was no Marines in my family. I was the first Marine. Um, my, I had a grandfather in the army as well. And then a grandfather that was in the air force. And then I had like uncles and stuff that were like, you know, served in different branches. And, um, yeah, I think when you come from like a military background, when you have that military history, although I can never really remember my talking about it with my dad so much, he wasn't a combat arms guy. He was a, uh, when he first came in, he was a missile repair man, I think, or something like that on the, on the, the missiles during, um, <laughs> He came in at the end of Vietnam War, but they didn't send him to Vietnam. They sent him to Germany to go work on like the missile defense systems. And then he then he started working for the combat support hospital because he went into the reserves and stuff and did Desert Storm. But I think watching him go right. to Desert Storm as a kid and seeing all that and then obviously now becoming more interested in it and watching military stuff, you know, obviously shaped my mindset to like this is like, oh, I'm going to do something else. Like I didn't even – you know, in high school, I didn't even take my SATs or anything because I'm like, what? Why would I waste my time I'm going to the military? You know, exactly. I, I'm the same way. I cut out of high school, beginning of my senior year, went down the recruiter because you know I heard if you went to college, you had to read books. I was like, I'm not doing that. That's the thing. And so, uh, <laughs> so I showed up uh, at the recruiter, and uh, you know, Gunny you know, basically says, uh, "Hey, so you know, you do drugs?" I said, "No." He goes, uh, you going to graduate? I said, I, I think so. He's like, you're in good shape? I said, yeah, captain, football, wrestling, lacrosse, you know, all good. He's like, all right, well, we could have you enlist today. I was like, seriously? I said, well, hold on a second. I said, look, my dad always made me work for everything that, you know, I wanted to do. So I'm going to have to pay for this myself. So how much is this going to cost? He goes, son, are you sure you don't do drugs? <laughs> and that, that was the beginning. And then when I told him, I, you know, he's like, well, what do you want to do? I want to be a Marine. He's like, well, look, we got a lot of jobs yeah. in the Marine Corps. You know, you get aviation you get mechanic. You could be a, you know, culinary school, this and that. And I'm like, no, I want to be a Marine. And he goes, well, like what? I said, so I pointed at the poster, like some Marine all cammied up running around with his M16. He goes, you want to be infantry? I said, you know, call what you want. I said, I want to be a Marine. Yeah. He's like, holy crap. We got a live one here. Guaranteed infantry. Yeah. Was that, what year was this? Uh, that was 82. Was there a lot of people going into the Marine infantry at that time? Probably not. Um, you know, I, I think that it was an interesting time. Well, it, it was an interesting time in that there was a lot of tension with Iran mm-hmm. at the time and uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini. And so, the, you know, there was a sense of patriotism. 
my high school had very few people going in the military. My high school had a lot of smart kids who were going to Ivy League schools. And uh, it turned out that, unbeknownst to me, one of my other classmates actually showed up as we were heading down to boot camp. And he was actually in my platoon oh, at boot cool. camp. But yeah, it was pretty cool. And then you got to remember, right around then, you also had Beirut mm-hmm. bombing that happened just after that. And so there was definitely, you know, some tension and some patriotism. And Reagan had recently just taken over and had just put a lot of money in fixing the military from where uh, Carter had pretty much decimated yeah. it. Yeah, it seems to be the trend. And so it was an interesting time. So, well, you you came in and listed, but all your family was officers. What, what's the deal with that? Were they okay with it? <laughs> well, my, my, my dad actually enlisted oh, first. Okay. My, dad had, he, my dad had a very interesting story. He uh, actually was a, a NIT championship basketball player in New York, so he had a wow. big name. And in his junior year, the, uh, the media at the time, which was the New York Times, said, hey, um, the Army has this Army Air Corps one-day enlistment program. You know, would you be interested in uh, joining? He goes, yeah, sure. He goes, great. We're going to do this whole spread on you. Takes him down. New York Times ran multiple photographs, full half-page a uh, story of Art Gerfine going to enlist in the Army Air Corps is a big, you know, media hit, and uh, he goes down. Well, at the end of the <laughs> the whole enlistment process, they're like, hey, we want to get one more photograph of you off to fight the war with your suitcase in your hand. He goes, suitcase? I don't have a suitcase. I just came from school. <laughs> He's like, all right, here, grab this suitcase. So you take a picture of him. The media is like, great, we're gonna run it tomorrow morning. My dad's like, all right, and he, you know, goes to take off, and the recruiter's like, hey, son, where are you going? I'm going home. He goes, no, get your ass on the train. He goes, no, no, you don't understand. It's just a publicity event. He goes, bullshit. You signed the paperwork. Oh, get man. on the train. He goes, all right, can I, he goes, can I at least tell my mom and dad? And so they're like, fine, go tell your mom and dad and then get on the first train tomorrow morning. So he goes home, says, mom, dad, guess what I did? I, I joined the army air Corps." And then they go, the hell you did. He goes, we already have one son at West Point. You're not going anywhere. Go to your room. No dinner for you. And he's like, what? So the next morning, his dad opens the newspaper, sees all these photographs oh of him, and so he goes, hey, honey, I think we better let him go. So he goes down, does all his basic training, but what ends up happening is he was six foot seven, so he couldn't fit in the trainers in, in, the, in the planes at the time. So they gave him an honorable discharge, said thanks for playing. He goes back to New York, plays his senior year of basketball back at N- N- uh, LIU, uh, they have a great season. And then he's like, well, the war is still going on. And he goes down to enlist in the Marines. And what ends up happening is the recruiter looks at him. He goes, son, how tall are you? He goes, six, seven. It's like, sorry, six, five's the cutoff. Like, what do you mean six, five? There's a freaking war yeah. going on. Come on. And he goes, look, the only guys we're giving waivers to are those who have prior service with honorable discharges. Yeah. He pulls out his paperwork. Next thing you know, he enlists, goes to Paris Island, but ends up getting picked up for an officer commissioning program and uh, ends up serving as an officer. But what was wild is when I came home that following day and I said, Hey dad, guess what? I enlisted in the Marine Corps. He goes, the hell you did. You can't, he goes, you can't take a shit on your own until you're 18 years old. I was like, what? He goes, you don't have my permission. You can't do anything. I'm like, well, and as I'm sitting there talking to my dad, the recruiter comes to the door. (laughs) He's standing there his deltas. He's like, ding dong. And my dad snapped back into Marine Corps captain mode. He's like, you wait outside you up in my room. (laughs) And all of a sudden my dad's like, what in the fuck are you thinking? And I'd never heard my dad curse before. I said, dad, I enlisted. He's like, the hell you did. He goes, what, what the hell do you, why would you even think about that? So dad, I want to be like you. He goes, all right, well, that's a good argument. I can't argue with that one. (laughs) So he signed the paperwork, and uh, next thing you know, you know, it was all good. Had a great run Man, for money. That what? That, what a crazy tale.